Hi, and welcome to the National Center on RTI's webinar on the essential component of database decision making. My name is Amy Ellich, and I am the de Deputy Director of the National Center on RTI. To begin, I'd like to go over the definition of RTI. The National Center on RTI has a definition for RTI that includes what we consider to be the essential components. You'll see in the first part, response to intervention integrates assessment and intervention within a school-wide multi-level prevention system to maximize student achievement and reduce behavior problems. It is important to point out that RTI is a school-wide prevention system as opposed to being a pre-referral for special education and it is multi-level as opposed to multi-tier. Although this will be addressed in more detail in later slides, it is important to understand that there are three levels of instruction in an RTI framework and district schools and states can have multiple tiers within those three levels of instruction in order to prevent school failure. The second part of the definition highlights the essential components of an RTI framework. The first component involves schools identifying students for at risk, at risk for poor learning outcomes. We, common, commonly re, hmm. we commonly refer to this process as universal screening. The next component involves monitoring student progress, which we commonly refer to as progress monitoring. The next component reference relates, relates to providing evidence-based interventions based on students' responsiveness. It is not merely the delivery of interventions, but that there is multi-level prevention system in which students have access to increasingly intense levels of instruction and interventions. The last component involves the use of data, for example, screening data, progress monitoring data, to adjust the intensity and nature of those interventions based on student responsiveness. In other words, there is an explicit systematic process for database decision making. Some people mistakenly believe that RTI is only about special education. It is important to remember that RTI is a school-wide, multi-level prevention system that results in data that may be used as part of the determination process for identifying students with specific learning disabilities or other disabilities. That is in accordance with your state law. So as I mentioned, RTI is a preventative framework. RTI is not another name for a pre-referral process. The intent of RTI is to improve outcomes for all students while providing immediate supplemental supports to students at risk for poor learning outcomes. And remember, RTI may be a component of a comprehensive evaluation for SLD determination, but that is not why we implement an RTI model. So as you saw in the definition, the center has identified four essential components for RTI. The first is screening, or a system for identifying students at risk for poor learning outcomes. The second is progress monitoring, or a system for monitoring the effectiveness of the supports provided to students. The third is a multi-level prevention system, or at least three increasingly intense levels of instructional support. Those levels are primary, which is the core instruction and curriculum, secondary, which is in addition to the primary level and provides supports targeted to students' needs, and finally tertiary, also supplementary, supplemental to the primary but more intense than secondary. And finally, we have database decision making. We can use that for instruction to determine who needs assistance, what type of instruction or assistance is needed, and is the duration and intensity sufficient? We can use it to talk about movement between levels, when to move students to something more or less intensive, who is responding and or not responding. We can also use it for disability identification. When do you refer for special education evaluation? How does this student compare to his or her peers? Did he or she receive appropriate instruction and in accordance with state law? The center has developed a graphic to highlight the RTI framework. Many of you probably associate the red, green, and yellow triangle with RTI. In reality, the triangle does not represent the entire RTI framework. It only represents one component, the multi-level prevention system. The center graphic takes into account all of the essential components and most importantly, the use of data to make decisions, which is often absent from the traditional RTI triangle. If you look to the far left, you see screening, to the far right, progress monitoring, and at the bottom, you'll see the multi-level prevention system. 
The three outer components require and are necessary parts of database decision making, which is why the arrows travel both directions. If these components are in place but data decision making is absent, then RTI is technically not being implemented. If you look in the center ring, you will see culturally responsive, meaning that the screening tools, progress monitoring tools, interventions, and database decision making procedures should all be culturally responsive. In the same ring, you will notice the phrase evidence-based, implying that all components are evidence-based. If these components are implemented through a cohesive model, we expect to see improved student outcomes. In a comprehensive RTI framework, data analysis is at all levels of RTI implementation, not just at the student level. For example, states can use RTI data to establish policies and guidance and to allocate resources, Districts can use data to evaluate the effectiveness of RTI, establish policies and procedures, and allocate resources. Schools can use data to evaluate the effectiveness of their overall framework and the essential components, assess alignment among grade levels, and allocate resources. Grade level teams use data to evaluate the core curriculum and instruction and identify students for secondary and tertiary instruction. Data analysis and decision making also occurs in all levels of the prevention system. For example, in primary, we are interested in how effective the core curriculum is as well as instruction of that curriculum. We also look at decisions about differentiation of instruction. With secondary and tertiary, we are looking at student level decisions, but also looking at how well particular interventions work for the majority of students in the secondary and tertiary levels. The Center recommends establishing routines and procedures for database decision making and data sharing. Districts and schools should have established routines and procedures, ideally in writing, for making decisions. Written procedures increase fidelity of the database decision making process, ensure equity of resources among students, classes, and schools, and help train new teachers more efficiently. Database decision making should reflect the use of logical and evidence based practices. Teams should follow pre-established routines and procedures for making decisions. For example, data teams should meet at regular scheduled intervals such as monthly or bi-monthly to systematically review data. Districts and schools should also establish explicit decision rules for assessing student progress and for sharing the information. This includes goal setting procedures, changing instruction or interventions, referring students to special programs, and moving students to more or less intensive tiers. These data reviews should be conducted at logical, predetermined intervals. The review should be scheduled prior to the beginning of instruction, involve established meeting structures, and involve relevant team members. Articulating routines and procedures in writing helps ensure and assess if established routines and procedures are being implemented with integrity. Ongoing evaluation of the selected routines and procedures is necessary to ensure they are culturally and linguistically responsive and lead to the desired outcome. So what are you looking for? Well, data phishing can be fun, but can lead to many problems. It can cause a delay in the use of data, especially if there are a lot of data, change the focus of the analysis, miss important trends or issues. You should identify what you are interested in knowing prior to your data analysis. If you are unclear what you're looking for, conduct an analysis of the more critical outcomes first, such as graduation or reading performance, and then focus on outcomes and other issues. It is important to prioritize. Identify what you are looking for at all levels of analysis. For example, district, school, grade, class, and individual students, and levels of prevention for efficacy and for struggling students. How will you look for it? Develop a plan on how you will systematically analyze your data. This can increase the efficiency of your data analysis activities. It also helps manage the output many data systems offer. Only the most critical data is needed first. This allows you to know where to delve in deeper. How will you know if you found it? Determine how much evidence is needed for the team to identify a problem. Once identified, the team can continue moving through the problem-solving process in order to develop an action plan. 
The third area we recommend establishing routines and procedures for in involves decision rules. This includes goal setting procedures, changing instruction or interventions, referring students to special programs, and moving students to more or less intensive tiers. Decision rules should be established at all levels, including class, grade, and school. Fourth, you should establish routines and procedures for sharing your data. You should communicate both the purpose of the data collection and the results. This should occur throughout the year, for example, following benchmark testing. Dissemination with discussion is preferred. Encourage all school teams to talk about the results, patterns, possible interpretations, and likely next steps. So what types of decisions can data inform? Well, we can identify students who need additional assessment and instruction. We can evaluate the effectiveness of the core curriculum and instruction. So is the core effective for most students? We can make decisions about allocating resources. We can evaluate the effectiveness of instructional programs for target groups. Are there differences among target groups? For example, differences between English language learners and Title I students. Disability identification. How do we know if the student should be referred and is eligible for disability identification? Using screening data, you can see students that are falling below their peers or determine benchmarks and are in need of additional assessment or instruction. On the left, this is an example of an individual student's grade two screening score. This box plot compares the student to his or her peer group, which is represented in the box. We can see that the student is performing well below his or her peer group. On the right, we can see which students are scoring below the target. Progress monitoring data can be used to confirm or disconfirm if students identified through screening as at risk are at risk for poor learning outcomes. The graph on the left shows that despite a low score on the screener, this student is progressing adequately in primary prevention in the general education classroom. In contrast, the graph on the right shows a student whose risk status would be confirmed and he or she would enter two, tier two or secondary prevention. This data shows that all students in the class fall below the target score, indicating that the core curriculum is not effective for all students. So here we can evaluate the effectiveness, or lack thereof, of the core curriculum. District schools and grade level teams can look at district-wide, school-wide, grade-wide, or class-wide performance over the year. This chart shows changes in percentage of students meeting criteria for each benchmark. This chart indicates that although only 55% of students met the criteria at the beginning of the year, 80% met it by the end of the year. In general, it appears that the instruction for that year is effective as students as a whole showed improvement across the year. But there might be a concern that students did not begin the year meeting the criteria. Resource allocation. Which schools appear to need additional support or further analysis? And looking closer at the schools in the district portrayed in this graph, the district might find school E, shown in dark purple, is performing far below the other schools in all three grades. It therefore may be necessary to provide school E with additional supports and resources. Districts and schools can also analyze performance by target group. Are students in Title I performing similarly to students in general education? Are students with disabilities performing at similar rates as students without disabilities? Growth rates are found at the bottom. It appears, based on this data, that the general education students in this district are outperforming the target group, yet both the Title I and special education populations fall below the target. It is also important to note that compared to the other groups, the special education students remain fairly flat across the year. In terms of disability identification, the National Center on RTI does not provide guidance on specific learning disabilities. We recommend you contact your State Department of Special Education and determine what the procedures are for your state. However, federal law states that 
to ensure that underachievement in a child suspected of having a specific learning disability is not due to lack of appropriate instruction in reading or math, the group must consider two things. The first one is that data that, pro that demonstrate prior to or as part of the referral process, the child was provided appropriate instruction in regular education settings. Screening data that looks at the growth rate of all students can help you answer this question. Progress monitoring data that can be shared with parents supports the next piece, database documentation of repeated assessments of, achieve of achievement at reasonable intervals. As mentioned previously, to ensure that the underachievement in a child suspected of having a specific learning disability is not due to lack of appropriate instruction in reading or math, the group must consider whether there is data that demonstrate that prior to or as a part of the referral process, the child was provided appropriate instruction in regular education settings. Screening data that looks at the growth rate of all students can help you answer this question. For example, in this graph, you can clearly see that when compared to his peers, this student is performing well below his peer group, but that the majority of his peers are above the cut score, indicating that the instruction is appropriate for most students. Progress monitoring data that can be shared with parents supports the next piece, database documentation of repeated assessments of achievement at reasonable intervals. This graph shows that across nine assessments, the student has not shown progress. Some things to remember. Good data in, good data out. Know where your data come from and the validity of that data. Focus on the big picture or all students. Are most students making progress? All instruction and curriculum decisions should be based on data. And finally, keep it simple and efficient. Don't collect data just because you can. Know why you are collecting it and what you will help you do or what decisions it can guide. In closing, just a few considerations when implementing an RTI model. It's easy to identify your model components, but implementing can be quite difficult and can take at least two to four years to get to full implementation. We recommend that you select and implement evidence-based practices and procedures. The tools charts available through the RTI Center can help you do that. You should also implement the essential components and identified framework with integrity. It's not enough to implement screening and progress monitoring with integrity. You also must ensure that the interventions, core curriculum and instruction, and data decision-making procedures are implemented with integrity. It is important to ensure that cultural and linguistic and socioeconomic factors are reflected in the RTI framework and its components. On the tools chart, there is a column that provides information about how particular tools have been used with different groups. Districts and schools should continually evaluate the efficacy of the model and model components for diverse populations. For more information, you can visit our website at www.rtiforsuccess.org. In addition to the Progress Monitoring Tools Chart, you'll also find two other tools charts to help you, one on screening tools and one on instructional programs. If you have questions, please email your questions to rtiwebinars at air.org. We will be having a live chat on February 24th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time to answer any questions submitted via email as well as any additional questions that come up during the online chat.